suggest where appropriate, especially if you've got the ear of, so let's say, the big international environment movements or governments or politicians or whatever, you know, there's nothing they love better than a win-win, some, some sort of positive alternative. Uh, and I think we could quite seriously say, and it's all in those papers that I'm leaving with you if you want to read it about it in a bit more detail, this is a movement, a new paradigm of how to do grasslands, how to govern grasslands and nomads, whether they are in Africa or the Middle East or Tibet or elsewhere. It's called the new range ecology. It's a real recognition amongst scientists and policy makers and development agencies that every time we intervened in the grasslands, whether it's in the, you know, the dry lands of Africa or wherever, we stuffed up. We actually made the situation worse. We spent you know, countless millions of dollars on development projects to, you know, ostensibly deal with the degradation of the grasslands and at the same time, you know, give the nomads some sort of livelihood and it just made the situation worse. And it was because every one of those projects started from the assumption that the nomads are basically pretty backward, uh, they don't understand the consequences of their actions, uh, limiting their mobility is almost the first thing that a government does because uh, we can't let them take roam in this area because that's where the best water supply is or that's where it's degrading so we have to sort of regulate them and fragment their lands and uh, and it was just created a complete disaster and those projects were so disastrous over so many decades at such cost that basically people sort of stepped back and said look we've got to face the fact that we're, we're getting this wrong at a very fundamental level let's rethink this and so the new range ecology came out, and, and the specialists in new range ecology are in Warwickshire. Uh, it, uh, Roy Benke and uh, Carol Curvin, uh, odessa.com. Uh, you'll find some links to some of the best sites in some of the stuff that I'm leaving you in print. They're, they're, they're actually very largely English-based. Uh, what they're basically saying is that the positive alternative is to actually let nomads be nomads. And, and, and design all of our policies to not restrict but actually respect and even enhance nomadic mobility. That mobility is the only way that the land of Tibet can ever be sustainable. That, and this actually comes back to one of the Exeter questions uh, about, uh, you know, what's wrong with intensive development? Maybe in an overpopulated world there's no longer room for uh, people to use the land extensively. Well. Globally, that may well be true, but I, I think there are reasons to suggest that there are certain parts of the world that are only suited to extensive land use or land use that uh, is not based on concentrating industrial production in particular areas because it's just too damaging. And Scotland is one. Uh, I mean, you know, the fact that Scotland hardly produces anything physical any longer uh, but, you know, largely it has a, an economy based on nature conservation and, and ecotourism that goes with it. And, you know, and it's precisely for the same reason as Tibet, that Scotland is also, you know, so cold and so difficult to, you know, produce anything physical uh, that it's actually sort of gone back to nature in the same way that Tibet could. Uh, so I'm not arguing that extensive land use is the only sort of land use that's legitimate around the world, but for Tibet, I think Tibet is a special case. It is the third pole, it is an extreme climate, it is also a highly unpredictable climate. According to China's census statistics, there are now uh, you know, 11 or 12 million people on the Tibetan plateau, half of whom are Tibetans and the other half are other nationalities, and that's simply unsustainable. It's just cannot be sustained unless you are pumping massive external inputs, pumping in food, energy, everything from outside. Uh, so I think on, on purely environmental grounds, I think there are actually strong grounds once we clear the air to suggest that the, the environment movement and the Tibet movement do have common ground, but the air needs to be cleared first.